Good afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to the 2022 Open Summit. My name is Zubin Austin. I am a professor at the University of Toronto, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to our summit on behalf of the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network and the Centre for Practice Excellence at the University of Toronto. Today, we are going to have an opportunity to learn, collaborate, and share focused on emerging research and new ideas in the pharmacy practice area. I'm very pleased to also introduce my co-host for today, Annalise Mathers, research officer here at the University of Toronto. Before starting, I would like to acknowledge that I'm on the traditional territory of many, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabeg, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat peoples, and this land continues to be home to diverse First Nations, Inuit, and other peoples. And I recognize that others joining us today from other parts of this country or others will be on different territorial lands, and I invite you to take a moment to provide your own acknowledgement. As you're likely aware, the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network is a team of multidisciplinary research. We work together to evaluate the quality outcomes and value of medication management services that pharmacists and other healthcare professionals provide. And as part of our commitment to our diverse communities, we foster knowledge translation and exchange in order to build capacity in this area. Today's event, our annual open summit, is part of that knowledge translation and exchange. The Center for Practice Excellence at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy is also participating in today's event. And our objectives are to um, utilize leading edge medication management research to generate new evidence and innovation in order to drive educational programs and practices that revolutionize patient care. Please consider joining us at our monthly speaker series, where we like to showcase speakers from around the globe focused on innovations and best practices of relevance, not simply to pharmacy, but to the broader healthcare system. With that, let me provide you with an overview of today's events. As you may be aware, this is the second summit day that we have had. Our first summit day last uh, two Wednesdays ago focused on using research to improve pharmacy education and continuing professional development. Today's event focuses on regulators and policymakers' perspectives on research in pharmacy. I'm sure you'll agree this is a very important issue, not simply for pharmacy practice researchers, but also for individual pharmacists. And we are thrilled to have our very special guest speaker, Katrina Mulheron, who Annalise will introduce in a moment, here to join us. A few uh, housekeeping items. Please note this event will be audio and video recorded and recordings will be available on our website, website shortly after today. We will also be moderating the question and answer period using the chat box feature in Zoom. Please use that chat box in order to forward any questions or constructive feedback so that we can all learn from the audience's experiences. Now, the aim of this summit is to disseminate and share knowledge generated through diverse research practices. We do ask that all of our participants recognize that some of the research being presented is still in progress and refrain from sharing specific results and data in, um, that we are presenting today through social media. With that, let me turn it over to my colleague Annalise Mathers to introduce our keynote speaker. Thank you again for joining us and enjoy the rest of today's summit. Over to you, Annalise. Thank you so much, Zubin. And I will just let Katrina get up her slides as I um, provide an introduction for her. Um, so Katrina is joining us today. She is a pharmacist and deputy registrar for the New Brunswick College of Pharmacists, where she pulls from her prior experiences in clinical, academic, and consultant roles. Her research interests include the impact of multimedia in qualitative research, examining the relationship between practitioners and their practice and transformative learning. As a regulator, she is interested in, in the application of research in behavioral economics and evidence-based pharmacy regulation. Thrilled to have you today as our keynote, Katrina. I'll let you take it away from here. Thanks, Annalise and Zubin, and thanks to Open for having me. Uh, I really appreciate that the organization recognizes that pharmacy regulatory agencies or PRAs have an interest and in stake in pharmacy practice research. My mission today in this short presentation, but dense, 
uh, is to expose the audience to regulator or policymaker perspectives on research in the hopes of spawning some ideas on how to make evidence-based regulation pervasive in Canada. So I have my own territorial acknowledgement. So here in New Brunswick, we respectfully acknowledge that the land in which we live and work is a traditional unceded territory of the Wulistigwe, Mi'kmaq and Passamaquoddy peoples. The treaties of pre peace and friendship, which these peoples uh, first signed with the British crown in 1725, did not deal with surrender of lands and resources. The treaties in fact recognize these three land titles and establish the rules for what was meant to be an ongoing relationship between nations. We recognize these treaties and are grateful for these first peoples of these nations with whom we share our land. So onto my image metaphor. Um, it's not just simply a tourism ad for New Brunswick. This, this is Fundy National Park, which is in, in the south of the province. And I took this in 2020 uh, in the late summer and it's a stream bed. Uh, it is actually the crossing of it, a part of the Fundy footpath, which if anyone has been on the Fundy footpath, it is ankle breaking terrain and known as some of the most difficult hiking uh, terrain in, in Canada. So the, the water in this picture I, I see as the flow of research. So you can see at the bottom, I've labeled some boulders, cobbles, pebbles, and sand. And so those are various types of policy with a small p. So I think just a note on terminology, um, some still use policy with a small p, um, but some thinkers and leaders in this field are starting now to use the word guidance as the umbrella term because policy has multiple meanings. And then regulators versus policymakers. Uh, policy is a subset of regulation. So I'm a regulator, I, I work in the regulatory sphere, but I'm also a policymaker, but not all policymakers are regulators. The rock size in this stream um, has meaning in that it is proportional to the weight and permanency of the guidance um, that's been developed. So research, your work, can exert force on these rocks in some cases to wear them down, change the surface, refine the policy. Research can also be so strong and compelling that it rolls new rocks into the stream it could potentially also wash policy right out into the ocean, or in this case, the Bay of Fundy. And I think this picture is an accurate depiction of the current flow of water or freshwater research among rocks of policy. We are absolutely not able to swim in it. We would be lucky to wade in it at this point. And then there's high tides. Uh, the Bay of Fundy has the highest tides in the world. Uh, I would equate the pandemic to being a record high tide that swept a few stones out to sea. It absolutely jumbled a bunch of our policy stones and wore down a lot of other rocks of, of policy. And then public expectations also shift the ground upon which these rocks rest and the stream rests. Disclosure statements. I am on the board of steep. It's not applicable to this uh, particular talk that I'm doing. I do have a second part to a disclosure statement, uh, which is uh, I attended open, actually I crashed open in 2013, and I agreed partially to participating in this talk in order to settle an old debt and clear my guilty conscience. Um, so, I mean, the crashing of it may uh, present me as having some ethical lapses, but I think it also presents me in a positive light in that I do have a really long-standing interest in pharmacy practice research. Okay, some provocative questions. Um, my presentation isn't going to answer most of these questions, um, but I think they're really important questions for uh, this audience to be asking themselves. And as I run through them, if there's one that really sparks interest, um, perhaps make a note of it. And I think when we go into the small groups, uh, perhaps it'll be a nice opportunity for you to bring up the question that speaks to you and maybe you can bandy it about a bit. Uh, the first, does regulation improve patient outcomes? Are regulators obliged to use research? Third question, how can regulators identify relevant research? Should regulators fund or perform their own research? What research do regulators need or want? 
what motivates researchers to consider uh, regulatory relevancy? And then finally, how can journals be encouraged to present research that is relevant to regulators? Short primer on pharmacy regulation. I think for people who haven't worked in regulation, it's a bit of a black box. Uh, regulation in Canada is achieved at a provincial level with some national influence, uh, in particular Health Canada and NAPRA, or the National Association of Pharmacy Regulatory Authorities, uh, would be the two big sort of national bodies uh, that we would look to regarding policymaking. Smaller provinces like mine in New Brunswick uh, rely on larger colleges and uh, NAPRA's research and policymaking to inform their regulator activities. We need to keep in mind that resources will vary and expertise uh, varies for colleges. Um, Prince Edward Island has two or three people only working in their college, whereas Ontario at the other end of the spectrum has about 130 staff, I think at this point. Also, I mentioned NAPRA, but um, they, they do have policy outputs, but they, those policies only have power if they're adopted by the Pharmacy Regulatory Authority. Uh, generally speaking, regulators are a risk averse bunch, and we are incredibly committed to the mandate of protecting the public's best interest. We are also very sensitive to public opinion and perception. Now, as I run through uh, the different activities that, that we do and how they intersect with, uh, with research, um, I think it's important to realize that all colleges, regardless of their size, have these similar departments. So quick overview of categories of regulatory activities, and um, you should be aware that all of these categories do, can, and should use evidence. And regulators are making efforts to use evidence and regulation and policy as a subset of regulation. Okay, the first category, professional competency. Um, the registration function would lie within this department. Um, so uh, broadly speaking, we are interested in making sure that new practitioners are ready for practice when they enter the profession. We are uh, interested in monitoring for ongoing competence and we uh, institute remediation when professionals fall below the expected standard. Uh, we have a presentation coming up today on adverse drug reporting and pharmacists' knowledge, skill, and behaviors that relate to that. So that type of research would fit into this type of, into this particular category. And then I'll also mention that two weeks ago with uh, Kyle Wilby, he did some, if you haven't seen that presentation, he's got some really great points on education intersecting with practice research, which I also thought were quite um, insightful with respect to this function of uh, regulation, right, uh, regulators. Uh, second category uh, is complaints and discipline or conduct as, as they call it in Ontario. Um, there's some research that can, could be really helpful here in terms of the analysis of regulator process. Um, legal professionals tend to be the ones that look at legal precedent, but there's no reason why pharmacy practice researchers couldn't look at that as well. And then uh, looking at non-compliance uh, and error outcomes. And that's, there's a shout out to A. Lang Foom, who's doing some great work right now in Canada, um, looking at error outcomes and how that uh, translates into complaints and discipline uh, challenges. Uh, so the research here, although maybe at first glance, it doesn't look like pharmacy practice. Um, this is where the disasters or the, the situations that don't um, meet standard filter down to. So I would argue actually that it does have impact on pharmacy practice uh, because the work or the research that could come out of this would inform upstream efforts to try and prevent these things from happening again. Um, external researchers, I would say, are challenged to access complaints and discipline data uh, because of privacy laws and, and uh, legislation, um, but it's not impossible. It takes time, diligence, and probably some pretty in-depth data sharing agreements. Quality slash compliance monitoring. Um, we're interested in outcome measurement uh, in order to identify new problems. Uh, we are in regulation starting to look at a couple of different types of endpoints for quality monitoring. We've got, we're really good at looking at surrogate end, 
endpoints such as compliance with the policies that we've released. And we use site visits, uh, practitioner declarations and surveys uh, as tools for surrogate endpoints. We are now just starting to see more work being done around publicly relevant or significant endpoints. So key performance indicators, there was a lot of really great work done around that um, through CSHP and KPIs. I mean, it's probably six, seven years ago. Um, and at this presentation today, we're going to uh, hear more about some work that OCP is doing on quality indicators with a community focused, um, a community focus. And then uh, medication incident reporting rates uh, and prevention activities. Um, those would be arguably significant endpoints that are relevant to the public. And we have a presentation on persuasive system design principles coming up um, that would fit with this uh, regulatory activity. Okay, um, now pharmacy practice guidance. Um, I've left this to the end because I think this is arguably uh, where the greatest meat and potential lies for synergy with uh, pharmacy practice researchers. Uh, so the um, PRAs, pharmacy regulatory authorities, we develop, refine, and retire regulatory guidance, and we do that and should do more of it based on, on evidence. Um, so research, I'm going to go through a, a few subcategories of, of practice guidance, but research has the ability to impact on any of these subcategories. And we have a presentation coming up from Nova Scotia on the impact of changes to, I'm not sure if it was legislation or policy, and I'm sure they'll tell us, uh, whereby they made a regulatory change to allow pharmacists to prescribe and then did the research to understand the outcomes of their intervention. Okay, first type of guidance, and it's at the top for a reason, the code of ethics. Uh, these are all provincially authored and it used to be considered a most solid boulder-like conceptual guidance that would only be reviewed every decade or so. So bioethical principles remain immutable, but the values of patients and practitioners are becoming ever more fluid. And so we're starting to, to realize that these uh, longstanding documents are probably better amended every three to four years. We don't see a lot of pharmacy practice research to date in this uh, realm of policy work that directly applies to codes of ethics. I would surmise maybe it's because ethics are notoriously slippery concepts, they're really hard to study and probably require unique skill set. Shouldn't dissuade anyone from considering some work in the code, code of ethics realm, but, uh, but we haven't seen a lot of it thus far. Legislation, for sure some boulders here. Uh, there are acts. Uh, that are provincial and federal, um, and these are rarely open for amendments. They're often uh, unchanged for decades, and they are designed to stand up over time. On the other hand, the fourth bullet point, which is provincial pharmacy regulations or bylaws or rules, those are essentially all the same thing. It just depends on where you are, what they're called. Those are the easiest things to budge um, by research findings. The ease of amendments to those regulations, bylaws and rules um, is variable though between provinces. And it seems to be predicated on how the acts set out the process for change and the timelines for amendments. There's also some, I think, relationship um, with the tightness or um, strength of the connections that PREs have with their Ministry of Health, as well as the regulators prioritization of issues. Standards of practice. Uh, we have brand new from NAPRA last month, new standards of practice for pharmacists and pharmacy technicians. And new standards of practice are a big deal. These are definitely a boulder in the stream. There's lots of expert uh, opinion, jurisdictional scanning and wordsmithing to balance the enabling of scope in these documents to balance that with patient protection. You will see in some provinces a few, um, I'll call them interim standards of practice, which seem to be, they are developed when the national standards of practice uh, don't keep up with the provincial scope changes. So when new things come along like pharmacy technicians being able to inject, uh, it wasn't in the old NAPRA standards of practice. So in New Brunswick, we actually had to develop our own 
subset of standards of practice. So, so the, the ones that are provincially authored are much more easily impacted, and I would consider those a pebble size of policy. Other practice guidance categories. So these ones would be considered in the pebbles to sand realm of size. Uh, some of these things need governing council's approval, but then some of them are actually actioned just at the uh, regulator, the college level. And your work, practice research, would have an excellent ability to influence these smaller stones of regulation on a provincial level. So policies, guidelines, practice directives, position statements, and then general communications um, to registrants. So how do regulators develop guidance? The black box, essentially where all rock comes from. So here's where I see you working with us. Um, you can see um, we've got this fuzzy problem here at the top and regulators get a signal uh, from various places and stakeholders that we've got a problem. And those could be, um, those signals can come from complaints, cases, uh, previously known history, anecdotes from practitioners, intuition, policy, either from government or maybe federal um, organizations maybe even other PRAs, public perception and experience. And so these things, any of them or all of them can combine in any way to, to make us realize we've got an issue. But then we actually need a precise problem. And we need a precise problem statement that has relevancy to patients and public. So at that point where we're thinking we're trying to refine to, to gain some precision, we start potentially doing research here that would include qualitative, quantitative investigation, literature synthesis, maybe some surveys, um, but most especially expert opinion. Um, and expert opinion, I've got a star there because at this point, uh, we are often trying to also quantify uh, the risk to the public in terms of the profoundness of, of risk on a scale, we use a one to 10 scale, and then uh, as well as a one to 10 scale in terms of the likelihood that it would actually impact um, on patients. And that helps us prioritize what, what fuzzy problems we're actually gonna work on and develop guidance. So once we've got the precise problem, um, actually I should also say, if we don't have a precise problem, if we're having a hard time um, stating the problem, um, there's a real risk that the work that we put in could be irrelevant, it could be effect, ineffective, and it could be actually even dangerous. Um, so it's really important that we get that precise problem established. Once we've got that, there's another node for potential research where we start doing environmental scans to see what other people, or sorry, other regulatory agencies have done, um, to look at literature, uh, to see what's described there, as well as maybe even some qualitative work uh, before we determine what guidance, in this case, that's the picture of the rock, uh, we're actually going to author here. So once we've authored the guidance, there's yet a third node of research that's possible um, and that should, that should occur at some predetermined stage where we look at the outcome of the release of this guidance. And there we could use quantitative or qualitative means to actually describe an outcome that could be what we would expect, i.e. effective, maybe neutral, or perhaps it has some unintended consequences that we can, we can capture. And then on either side of my uh, hand-drawn whiteboard, um, I, there were a couple of pieces of research that's, that, that came to mind that, that we've recently done here in New Brunswick. And the, uh, the one on the right, the drug versus methadone toxicity in New Brunswick, we actually um, amassed this data and did a very obviously simplistic analysis, the data came from our coroner, uh, and we were trying to decide uh, if we still wanted to um, have a methadone practice directive. And if we were to uh, reopen the methadone practice directive, um, should it all be about methadone? Uh, how do, is, is there still justification for the detail uh, with which we uh, regulate the use of methadone in OAT, opioid agonist, uh, treatment. And then another piece of research that came to mind that we used a few years ago was on the left. And there we used it at the second node of research as we developed the guidance. And it was, um, we were developing a practice directive on mandatory medication incident reporting. 
and we did an, a literature analysis and in particular this piece of research stood out for us as really needing to be encompassed and cited within this particular piece of policy. Okay, um, facilitators uh, for evidence-based regulation that would be under the control of regulators. So the first thing would be to establish some in-house or maybe contracted uh, research expertise. And we would need that expertise, or many of us would just need to establish it. Others may need to, to um, increase it with respect to actually conducting research, synthesizing evidence. And I, I see also we could use some expertise, even just to set up some journal alerts um, for regulators, but we might need some help from researchers and maybe some librarians on this, on this point. Regulators should be uh, looking to make room at the decision-making tables and the policy-making tables um, for researchers. Regulators would need access to non-academic REBs where their researchers in-house may not have academic appointments. Scope of research um, should be established at a level that may overcome interprovincial nuances. Now, this would be more important if um, the project that you were looking at were, was so broad and maybe so expensive that you would need multiple jurisdictions to feed into it. So there's always a challenge, and that's the fourth, fifth point, to gain consensus on research priorities um, across jurisdictions. But sometimes it, it may be um, necessary, depending on, on the project that we'd be looking at. And then, of course, to establish, um, to establish a budget. Facilitators for evidence-based regulation, what would be under the uh, control or influence of the researcher? Uh, to publish in a location uh, that regulators look would be important and that we can gain access. To establish your own catalog of data sources, because we recognize uh, in regulation, there's such a disparate set of data sources. And this is just a short list. Um, some of them you're probably aware of, some of them may be new to you, and in particular, the last one, the Pan-Canadian Health Data Strategy. I think that's even brand new since uh, COVID, the pandemic. So that, that is an emanation out of the pandemic. And if you haven't uh, made yourself familiar with it, I think um, it's in that germination phase um, right now, but I, I, you, can, you can find online at, on the Health Canada website, a lot of information about this new organization. Uh, just to note about registrant data, I put it up there, um, but there's a caveat in that privacy policies and legislation within each province may make accessing college registrant data challenging. It's not impossible, but it's challenging. To collaborate with, with regulators, definitely a facilitator. Um, and that collaboration, ideally, I think, should start at the conceptualization stage of your research project. The development of the research question itself and the project design could benefit uh, from the input of a regulator at that early stage. Likewise, when it comes to publication, if you can have a regulator join you as you write, it should induce some precisions on, precision on the implications of your research. I would encourage you to advocate for seats on boards or councils or seats on practice policy advisory committee and working groups. Now, this, you have to understand that the regulator's priorities are set um, for often years in advance. Um, but if you can start the ball rolling on, on gaining access to these um, policy or it, on, into these committees or places where policy decisions are being made, you could essentially be the conduit between your research community and the regulatory authority. You might wind up being a non-voting member or maybe even just showing up and seeing if you can observe, but it may require changes to terms of references um, and existing governance procedure within the regulatory agency. It could take you months or years to establish that seat at the table. So uh, I guess what I'm saying is start working on it now. Um, the last point, the fifth point, national joint forums or committees. Um, 
I'm wondering when we'll be ready to establish or if we are ready to establish a national collaboration between potentially NAPRA and a corresponding national group of pharmacy practice researchers. Do you already have such a group? I'm, I'm not sure and I'm, I'm interested in understanding that. So I think if these things happen, the flow of research will have increasing likelihood of moving some of the regulatory rocks that, that uh, I showed you earlier. And ideally your, your research uh, will be more relevant. It will be uh, more feasible. It'll have greater reach. We'll be able to implement it and it'll have a greater impact. Okay. Um, we would need to, we would, you would need to identify uh, interested funding sources, and it's not just regulators. Uh, think about Health Canada, provincial governments, third party payers. You may have already some other ideas of funding agencies. I think we need to negotiate some, our researchers need to negotiate some tensions between what the regulator needs and priorities are, um, what funding agency interests are what journal or editor requirements for publication are. And uh, peer review is incredibly beneficial in that it introduces rigor to the research and allows you to be published, therefore. Um, but regulators do struggle with this and we would absolutely value researcher expertise lending this rigor. And then the fourth point, the researcher curiosity. Um, I think that brings me back to one of the initial questions, which was what motivation do researchers have to consider regulatory relevancy? And I'm thinking that esoteric is not necessarily ethical. And as I was reading last night, um, I don't know if you've heard of this book, Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmer. She's a Haudenosaunee First Nations um, person. And she says, this is our work to discover what we can give. Isn't this the purpose of education to learn the nature of your own gifts and how to use them for the good, for good in the world, um, which is coming up to an, I, I would say, um, an ethical approach um, in terms of what our obligations are in performing research and putting all that work into research, but potentially not seeing it actually ever be implemented. Okay. Right, I'm going to speed through some resources, um, things that you places and organizations you may not be aware of. There's an American National Association of Boards of Pharmacy. They have a research page, really interesting. Um, if you want to go have a look there and see what some American researchers are doing, this is my favorite by far. The Professional Standards Authority out of the UK. They also have a research page. They also are leading thinkers on right touch regulation, and I've put the link there. Uh, so that you can understand what, uh, what best practice is philosophically with respect to regulation of, of healthcare providers. Australia has a research page, not as, um, I guess, broad as the Americans and the British, but still it's there. And then there are four uh, well-regarded conferences that you may be interested in. There's poster presentations that happen at these. There's also podium presentations um, that your research could find its way into. Now, finally, a short list of journals. Um, some of us look at these more regularly than others. Uh, out of this presentation, I think what I've realized is I'm about to do up my own alerts. Um, for some of these journals to make sure that I'm, I'm seeing what's coming out worldwide with respect to this type of re pharmacy practice research. Okay, um, so just one final note about this stream. Um, as of last year, it was published that Atlantic salmon are actually starting to come up this, this river again to spawn and the conditions have been improving incrementally uh, for these fish. So it's a hopeful situation, but it's still delicate that we'll need the commitment of stakeholders to ensure a reliable flow of water and the other conditions other than the water are maintained. Similarly, stakeholders will need to commit to a long-term vision of evidence-based regulation in order to establish a healthy stream of compelling pharmacy practice research. 
And with that, I'll conclude. I'm looking forward to hearing from today's researcher presenters. And I think we might have a couple minutes for, for any questions, if there are any. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Katrina, for walking us through. Um, bit of a, a plug for, for New Brunswick, <laughs> as well as um, kind of the regulatory landscape. I think probably a lot of new information for, for people online. I know for myself, that's definitely true. Um, and, and some great resources as well at the end. Um, not so much a question, but a quick comment from Barb uh, just in the chat. She was wondering if perhaps after um, a little bit of Q&A, you can add some of the journals to the chat box. I think she was curious on uh, getting those getting those jotted down. Okay, I can I can do my best. If not, I think she knows how to get a hold of me too. <laughs> Yeah, great. Maybe while we're just waiting um, for people to put in their questions, we have about five or so minutes um, for questions for Katrina. Um, wondering your thoughts. I mean, there's been a lot of pretty significant changes in the past few years. Some you're very familiar with, like medical aid and dying, um, COVID vaccinations, legalization of um, cannabis. And so I guess curious your thoughts on what you perhaps see as a really good example of how pharmacy practice research has worked for regulators and or contrasted with something that perhaps hasn't worked so well? Hmm. So I say um, in the last five years that I've worked on policy, uh, where I saw the greatest amount of work that was applicable was in the medication incident reporting sphere, which is really, excellent because um, we all identify in, in regulatory land that that is like the top thing um, that we need uh, in terms of mitigating risk is um, better reporting. And we have lots of research from the States, UK, and some in Canada as far as how to get people to report and the importance of that. So I think that might be the success story that I can think of with respect to pharmacy practice research uh, and policy making. Um, so I'm gonna talk about MEAD actually with, with University of Toronto at another, at another point. And, and I would look at that as, um, huh, that, that, that one was a really hard one to do because um, we actually had no data and, and very little research, at least in Canada, we had some out of, out of Europe but very little pharmacy practice data before that legislation was changed at the federal level. So we were really working in the dark um, and trying to anticipate what the risks would be. So I guess, you know, those are sort of two contrasting, but every, every policy that we try and make is so unique um, in terms of, um, you know, where it is in, in, in terms of the arc of development. Is this a, a de novo development or a de novo problem? Or is this an old problem that we've had a solution to for years, but just isn't working anymore? Great. Thank you so much for that. A few questions have come in, so I'll try and get to those um, and carry us along. Um, from Derek, thanks for the great presentation, Katrina. When it comes to outcome measurements, do you, or outcomes measurement, do you find that pharmacy practice researchers tend to select endpoints that allow PRAs to adequately assess impact on protection of the public? So the outcome measures, it's been really difficult, I think, for researchers to meaningful, meaningfully select their outcome measures because we hadn't established them. So it's sort of like the chicken or the egg. And when OPEN first started, um, I think what I saw as being beneficial from this, uh, this, this work that the organization was doing was that through all of the research, we would actually now be able to use evidence to establish what the outcome indicator should be. So are we, I think we're getting to a critical mass now where, um, and with, with, you know, if we look at the KPIs, that's, that's already been established, but within the community context, I think now we may be at a point where we can actually start to compile this research and understand what the common themes of, um, of quality outcomes are. So I think uh, to answer maybe Derek's question is that it's getting better. 
Um, and now I would say we almost need to synthesize the existing research and walk away from the, the, the publications with uh, an overall listing or catalog of meaningful outcome measures. Great, thank you for that. Um, last comment that perhaps you'd also like to comment on in the chat box is from Greg. Um, great presentation. I would emphasize the need for research around practice ethics for two reasons. The scope of ethical dilemmas in health are likely to increase and many of and many of the practice deficiencies of pharmacy team members re kind of the ethically inclined. I, that that is so true. And, you know, a lot of the uh, policy that regulators author and, and the programs that we've implemented, if if practitioners understood how to use um, ethics skillfully uh, and developed um, competency with ethics, I would argue that we actually wouldn't need a lot of what we have in terms of legislation, policy, um, and standards of practice. So it, it is germinal. It is just abs, I can, yeah, I can't stress enough how important the work is around codes of ethics and ethical um, behaviors. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much, Katrina. If anyone else online has other questions and or um, the journal titles, I'll let, I'll let that, those conversations continue in the chat box. But on behalf of, of the Open Steering Committee and myself, thank you so much um, for such an insightful presentation. Thank you. I'll now um, turn us over to uh, the beginning of our research presentations for today. So we have a nice lineup of four research presentations that will take place before our small group sharing rooms. Um, the first research presentation today is from Anissa and Karen. Um, I will let them get their slides up as I introduce both of them. Welcome. So Karen holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and a certification in data analytics, big data and predictive analytics. She's currently the policy and analytics officer at the Ontario College of Pharmacists providing data analysis and reporting support for multiple departments across the college. Over her time at the college, she's worked on the quality indicators for community pharmacy initiative, the assurance and improvement and medication safety or AIMS program, and led the college's first reporting of quality improvement data for pharmacy. Anissa is a strategic advisor for policy also at the Ontario College of Pharmacists, where she leads the opioid strategy and quality improvement initiative. She's also an entrepreneur in the long-term care and retirement home sector. Prior to joining the college, Anissa was the director of clinical services at Medical Pharmacies Group, where she was responsible for a national team of clinical consultant pharmacists servicing long-term care and retirement homes across Canada. Anissa graduated with an honors bachelor of science in pharmacy from the University of Toronto and a master's of science with distinction from the University of Kent. Welcome both and I'll turn it over to you. Thanks so much. I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Karen Taylor and I'm joined by my colleague Anissa Shivji and we're here to talk about establishing the first set of quality indicators for community pharmacy in Canada. What we're hoping you'll get out of this session is information on what quality indicators are and why we as the regulators set out to establish them, an overview of the processes used to establish the quality indicators, an update on the current state and implementation of the different quality indicator measurement areas, and a look into the next steps for quality indicators for community pharmacy. To start us off, quality indicators are tools that help quantify healthcare processes and outcomes, patient perceptions, and system factors that enable high quality healthcare. There are measures that reflect issues that are important to both the public and the health system stakeholders who use them. In this case, groups like the college and community pharmacy professionals. Quality indicators are widely used throughout the health system. We all know them to look at things like surgical wait times in hospitals, but we wanted to use them to look at community pharmacy. At the time of starting this work, quality indicators weren't something to our knowledge that other regulatory colleges had established. We knew that a standard set of quality indicators would allow us to measure pharmacy care and its impact on patient and health system outcomes across the province in a consistent way. 
as the regulator responsible for protecting and serving the public measurement for the purposes of quality improve improvement and knowing that these indicators will ultimately help us understand and improve pharmacy care is very in line with our mandate. Additionally, this type of measurement and the public reporting element of the quality indicators was aligned with our commitment to transparency as a college. We knew that this was important work to bring this type of measurement to community pharmacy and that we needed to get it right. This is why we partnered, partnered with the expert on quality indicators for the province, Ontario Health, for the initial indicator selection process. This indicator selection process began back in 2018 with a stakeholder roundtable where patient and caregiver experience, appropriateness of dispensed medications, medication-related hospital visits, transitions of care, and provider experience were identified as priority areas for measurement. The measurement areas were then brought to an expert panel who were tasked with selecting a small set of quality indicators. The indicators you'll see today are derived from 300 plus indicator candidates found through a literature scan and selected using a modified Delphi process, which consisted of a series of consensus meetings and independent surveys. Feeding into the final decision-making were a series of patient and sector engagement activities, including stakeholder meetings and webinars and consultation surveys targeting both patients specifically as well as the pharmacy sector and public more broadly. This ultimately led to the selection of seven quality indicators across four of the measurement areas and the recommendation to continue review and discussion of the fifth measurement area, which was provider experience. Since 2019, there's been progress on data collection and reporting and moving the provider experience measurement area forward. I'm gonna pass it over to Anissa to talk about work since the ind indicator selection process and what's next for quality indicators. Great, thanks, Karin. So I just wanted to highlight where we are with each of the measurement areas that Karin identified. So with regards to the appropriateness of dispensed medications, um, medication-related hospital visits and transitions of care, the data for these measurement areas was obtained from available administrative data sets. And so public reporting um, of data trends is available currently on the college website. With regards to the measurement area of patient caregiver experience, or what we refer to as PREMS, patient reported experience measures, we're currently in the process of engaging various stakeholders to really try and understand the operational intricacies around each of the patient recruitment tools, as well as data collection methods before we proceed with one set data collection and patient recruitment method. Once we have determined um, with our conversations with various stakeholders a way forward, we will be piloting potential patient recruitment and data collection methods and um, looking at the results of this pilot before spreading to all the pharmacies in Ontario. With regards to the provider experience and engagement measurement area, we're currently in the process of data collection and analysis of the themes. So the provider experience and engagement measurement area was one identified as important to measure by the expert panel um, because there is that link to quality and outcomes. You may be familiar with the quadruple aim framework, which does reflect the importance of provider satisfaction. So in this case, the provider would be the pharmacy professional in optimizing patient outcomes and overall health system performance. So as Karin mentioned, for the other four measurement areas, the work was led by an expert panel, but for this measurement area in particular, the process was led by a working group comprised primarily of pharmacy professionals. It was a similar iterative process with consensus meeting and the, the working group was fed over 200 consultation sur survey responses received from pharmacy professionals. With regards to where we are with this measurement area, the indicators were established in December of 2021 and presented to the board and data collection began with the January 2022 registrant annual renewal where anonymous data collection took place and we're currently in the process of looking at the various themes that have stemmed from this data collection. 
So this is a summary slide of all of the quality indicators that were established, both by the expert panel as well as by the working group. And if you'd like more information on these or more details, we have provided links at the end of this presentation. Um, but we just thought it would be important to highlight these indicators and in terms of how they're currently publicly reported today. So if you look at the next slide, you'll see this is how the public reporting is currently taking place on the college website. So again, it's important to highlight that there's no access to pharmacy specific data. The way that the data is reported is through aggregate trends. Even when the data is collected, it's anonymous. Um, and the reason for that is because the goal for these indicators is not to be punitive or performance. It's really to, to drive quality improvement in the, in the sector and encourage public transparency. So for instance, if you look at the high dose opioid incidence indicator, it's really for pharmacy professionals to reflect back on their own um, experience and their own practice, work with their teams to really try and understand uh, how do they evaluate appropriateness of dispensed medications, for, in, for instance, when it comes to opioid high dose incidence, what tools and resources are available. And these conversations are also had with during the assessments team, um, when an assessment takes place at the pharmacy, there is a conversation about various tools and resources available to help drive quality improvement with these indicators. So in terms of next steps for this work, um, really we want to try and increase the awareness of these indicators and the goals for these indicators compared to um, a lot of the other indicators in the health system and what resources are available to, to the sector to really encourage and drive this quality improvement in community pharmacy. As I mentioned, in terms of the provider experience indicator measurement area, we're currently in the process of data collection. So we will be looking at taking a look at these, these themes that have been derived from the data collection, analyzing them and exploring some of the contributing factors. So for instance, you know, if a high level of pharmacy professionals report burnout, what are the contributing factors to those levels of burnout? So really working together with stakeholders to trying to understand those factors and improve the pharmacy professional experience. Taking a look at the PREMS indicators and the best way forward in terms of how to capture that patient experience data in community pharmacy. And then we will also be regularly evaluating the indicators within each measurement area. So for instance, right now, um, two of the indicators refer to opioid prevalence and incidents, um, really looking at whether those are still relevant in the next year or two and applying a certain criteria to see if other indicators need to be updated or evaluated. Um, so that will be something that we do on a regular basis as well. And lastly, you may have noticed that these indicators are very community centric. And the reason that community pharmacy was chosen as an initial focus was because there were indicators really already present in um, a variety of other sectors in pharmacy practice. So for instance, in long-term care, as well as in hospital pharmacy. So really starting with um, where there was the most pertinent gap in community pharmacy, but we will be exploring, expanding to, to other practice environments beyond community pharmacy. So these are some links that we've included. Um, for more information, uh, you can also reach out to us if you have any more uh, questions or would like further information. So the first is really highlighting the quality indicators for pharmacy um, initiative as a whole. The second is the summary report for the quality indicators, which um, was an output from the expert panel. And the third is around this data reporting tool and how um, the public views the, the aggregate trends for the currently available administrative data sets. And the last is really an article in the Pharmacy Connection highlighting the role of provider experience and why this measurement area was important for the indicators initiative. So now I'll just pass it over to Annalise if there's any questions for myself or Karin. Thanks. Great. Thank you both so much for that. Um, I'll also maybe encourage both of you to put those those resources into the chat after um, after a few questions, but I'll get right into those. From Anne, how are these quality indicators different from the quality assurance program that was instituted several years ago? 
is it is the, it the evolution of the previous one or something different? <laughs> so that's a really good question. Um, I think in terms of these indicators in particular, the main focus, as opposed to it being quality assurance and performance, was really around trying to drive quality improvement and public transparency. So really from the get-go, they had differing goals. So in terms of looking at even uh, aggregate data trends as opposed to individualized performance metrics. So that's really where the majority of the, the differences came in. Great, thank you so much. And then I'll also ask a question from Andrea in the chat. Are there any patient reported outcome measures versus experience measures being contemplated at this time? That's a great question. Um, so in when we first established the measurement areas, they were actually meant to be PREMS and PROMS. Um, but as we move forward in terms of indicator selection, we did decide to, to start with one and potentially expand and include another in, in future years. And so what we decided to, to start with was um, PREMS primarily because there were similar um, indicators available in, in all of the literature that were reviewed. And so that was really what we decided to start with. But if you do look at, for example, the summary report and the initial work of the expert panel, the intent is to um, eventually expand to include both PREMS and PROMS. Fantastic. That's a great plug for what Katrina was saying about the need for research and regulation to, to really intersect and build off each other. Um, I'm going to ask this, the first half of this last question is because I think it's a, a great one. How do you motivate and facilitate both public and provider reporting? And then I'll let you maybe go back and forth with Greg in the chat about the in actual input rates. So I'm curious your thoughts on that question. So that's another really great question. Um, and so essentially right now we are, um, one of the, the measurement areas, which is PREMS, which is re with regards to pub basically public reporting um, on the patient experience, we are currently in the process of still having those conversations with stakeholders because um, we really want to try and maximize the response rate. So really, um, to your point, Greg, how do we motivate patients to respond to, for example, an experience survey um, when you know there's other organizations or other health systems that are also trying to get them to fill out their experience survey? So really, how do we stand out? How do we capture that patient data? And that's really um, the discussions that we're having with um, the operational leaders in community pharmacy to try and understand um, what that looks like, what response rates have been in the past, and also um, having those discussions with patients in terms of, okay, um, how do you spend that time when you're waiting for your, for example, prescription to be filled? Uh, within that time, how could we motivate you to provide details on your patient experience? With regards to um, provider experience reporting, that's another great question. So we're currently in the data collection phase of that. Um, in terms of our response rate, once we have uh, completed the data collection phase, I think we'll have more of a sense of what those response rates look like. But we have really been focusing communication around the anonymity of the data collection, which we believe is really important to ensure that you know, registrants feel comfortable providing an honest response and providing a response. Um, so we, we are continuing to highlight that in communication, really trying to work with stakeholders. So really um, everyone is aware of kind of the, the end goal here, especially due to the um, vulnerability required when answering these types of provider experience questions. Yeah, thank you for your thoughts on that, Anissa. I think a really important question and probably one that you think about quite often at the college. Um, so thank you. Thank you, Karin. Thank you, Anissa, for your presentation. Um, I'll let communication happen in the chat as we carry on. Um, but I'd like to introduce Dr. Shanna Treneman next. Uh, Shanna, I'll let you get your slides up on the screen. Um, Shanna is a hospital pharmacist and a postdoctoral fellow with geriatric medicine research at the Department of Medicine Dalhousie, at Dalhousie University. Dr. Treneman is a clinician scientist who studies appropriate drug use in older adults from the perspectives of pharmacology, epidemiology, pharmacoepidemiology, and health services research. 
Thanks, Shanna, I'll let you take it away. I could not unmute myself once I was sharing my slides. Um, I will put them back up. I think this will work quite quickly now. There we go. Uh, I'm excited to be here today. Um, and I'll just let you know, I am presenting from my home in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq people. Um, here I live and work on the land of the Peace and Friendship Treaty. We are all treaty people. And I'm really excited to speak about this project and build upon the discussions that were started uh, a couple of weeks ago when the open conference began. So I am presenting on behalf of the research team that's led by Dr. Jen Eisner, and we have no conflicts of interest to declare. And we were interested in understanding how the prescribing activities of pharmacists in Nova Scotia um, and how those prescribing activities changed over time. Uh, it seems here in Nova Scotia that pharmacists were first given the legislated authority to prescribe in 2011, uh, and that was prescribing within a limited capacity. But since that time, the legislation has evolved and it continues to evolve. And at the time of evaluation of our study, pharmacists in Nova Scotia could prescribe within seven loose categories. So six categories of pharmacists prescribing services are shown here. Uh, first, we have prescribing for an approved indication or condition. Generally, we refer to this as uh, prescribing for a minor ailment, and there's a list of approved conditions uh, from which the pharmacist may independently prescribe, and they are shown in that long rectangular box to the side. Uh, pharmacists are also able to prescribe a renewal which refers to providing additional refills on a previously prescribed medication to ensure continuity of care. A therapeutic substitution allows substitution of a medication from within the same class. Prescribing an adaptation refers to alteration of a dosage form or dose. It's also permitted for pharmacists to prescribe medications which do not require prescription for sale, but may be covered by a drug plan with a valid prescription. Um, prescribing in an emergency is permitted as well. And then additionally, in January of 2020, government funding was implemented to financially support pharmacists prescribing of contraception, treatment of uncomplicated bladder infections, and treatment of shingles. So these prescribing roles for pharmacists in Nova Scotia provide increased access to primary care, which is a current issue of great concern in the province. Uh, close to 70,000 individuals in Nova Scotia are on the Need of Family Practice Registry, awaiting attachment to a primary care provider. So this family physician shortage is a significant focus of our provincial government at present. And while pharmacists can't replace primary care providers, they can provide access to some primary care services while more long-term solutions are investigated and implemented. But just because pharmacists have the legislated authority to assume some primary care responsibilities like prescribing, it doesn't mean that all pharmacists will embrace prescribing. And it also doesn't mean that Nova Scotians will accept pharmacists as prescribers or use those services. So with this gap in the knowledge of how pharmac pharmacists are employing prescribing in practice, we aimed to describe pharmacists prescribing services in fiscal years uh, 2018, 2019, and 2020. We also aim to describe the characteristics of pharmacists who prescribe prescribing services and to describe those patients who use. So we used a retrospective observational cohort study design using a linked administrative health data and the data were collected from the 1st of April 2017 through the 31st of March 2020 to describe pharmacists and the prescribing services they provided along with the patients using these services. So we therefore created two separate cohorts, one of the pharmacists who provided the pre prescribing services and a second of the uh, patients who used pharmacist prescribing services. If there are specific questions about the methods, I'm happy to discuss those in the question period. And as I go through the results, I'll point out relevant methodological notes um, as appropriate. So we found that 80% of the approximately 1,300 pharmacists in Nova Scotia had prescribed over the period of study, with the number of pharmacist prescribers increasing each year. 
If we look at the number of prescriptions that were written by pharmacists, it's quite impressive. And depending on the year, it varied from 300,000 to 450,000. Um, that sort of corresponds to a mean of 21 prescriptions being written each month by each prescribing pharmacist in 2018, which increased to 29 in fiscal year 2020. Overall, this kind of corresponds to a mean number of prescriptions in 2018 at um, 261 prescribed by each pharmacist who prescribed, and that increased to 347 in 2020. So that's an increase of nearly 100 prescriptions a year over those three years, um, which probably corresponds to about two extra pharmacist prescriptions in a week. We considered rurality of the pharmacists based on the second digit of the postal code of those pharmacist prescribers. And we found that pharmacists licensed in rural areas prescribed more than pharmacists in urban areas, which was a statistically significant difference. Patterns of family physician shortage generally demonstrate reduced access in rural areas, which is consistent with increased pharmacists prescribing in rural areas and may show that pharmacists prescribing services are being accessed to fill gaps in primary care. Undoubtedly, the prescriptions we captured as pharmacists prescribing varied with respect to category. However, current administrative health data collection is unable to allow us to distinguish between these categories. That said, we collected the DINs of the medications associated with each indication as listed here in the figure. So this um, includes the three government funded indications which are starred in the graph. And then the list of the DINs was created using a list of all potential appropriate treatments for each condition by a pharmacist. And then the list of identified DINs of the actual prescribed drugs was applied to those pharmacist prescribed medications um, that we captured. So to enter, identify the most likely distribution of pharmac pharmacists prescribing by indication. Um, I think that's clear. We looked at all the pharmacists prescribed medications, we looked at these conditions, we came up with all of the potential treatments for these conditions, and then sort of cross referenced to see how it, um, how it looked. Um, treatments for GERD were the most frequently prescribed, and treatments for herpes simplex the least frequent. And there are lots of ideas to be untangled here in this figure. Um, and I'm going to share a few of mine. But before I talk about sort of the specific indications, I want to point out a couple of things. First, that the data collection period predates COVID-19, essentially. It captures the first 20 days of the pandemic. And those first 20 days of the pandemic are the last 20 days of the data collection period. I also should point out that the government funding for those three starred items was in place only for the three months of 2020, uh, which were the last three months of our data that's included in the analysis. So we can't really say what amount of pharmacists prescribing for those three items occurred before and after that change in legislation. But about the specific indications, first note that vaccines, both travel and non-travel, comprised a substantial portion of the pharmacist prescribing recorded. Second, self-limited GERD, which can be treated either with over-the-counter or prescription treatments, is very frequently encountered by pharmacists in community. It's likely something that they are very comfortable and experienced with. And it was quite interesting that that's the most frequent um, indication uh, prescribed for. And third, uh, contraception was frequently prescribed. Pharmacists uh, facilitated access to contraception, a medical intervention that provides benefit in terms of you know, improved education, participation in the workforce, job choice, and more to anyone with a uterus. So having this increased access to contraception likely has a very far reaching impact. The volume of prescriptions pharmacists prescribed to each age category of patient was related to the number of patients in each age category in the patient cohort. However, the age distribution of the patient cohort was not the same as the age distribution of the provincial population. At around 35 to 49 years of age, the number of individuals accessing pharmacist prescribing service began to exceed the percent of the population, or more simply put, older adults used pharmacist prescribing services more. Examining the mean number of pharmacist prescribed medication, and that's referred to as first fills in this slide, we see that the number increases with patient age to a mean of more than four prescriptions per patient over 80 years of age over the three year period. We also saw access to pharmacist prescribing services 
differ by the rurality of the patients accessing them. We found that the number of prescriptions per patient over the period of study was higher in rural areas at 3.17 prescriptions per patient compared to 2.79 prescriptions per patient in urban areas, a statistically significant difference. When we consider the medical state or health of the patients using pharmacist prescribing services, we see that patients living with more comorbidities use more prescribing services, with the mean number of prescriptions per person being significantly higher for individuals with a higher number of comorbidities for all pairwise combinations. And even though there are limitations with the collected data, the analysis demonstrated that over the three-year period of observation, pharmacists provided increased prescribing services each year. Those patients using pharmacists prescribing services were more likely to be older, reside in rural areas, and living with more comorbidities compared to those not using pharmacists prescribing services. So this work is a priority area for the Maritime Spore Support Unit, and it was my privilege today to share these findings with you on behalf of our team led by Dr. Jen Eisner. And there's lots of uh, familiar names uh, in our team, uh, especially uh, with the people who are joining today. I saw some familiar names uh, there. So uh, I look forward to your questions and our discussion. Wonderful, thank you so much, Shanna. Um, not sure if any questions will come in, um, but just in the name of time, I think I'll probably just ask a question and then let the conversation continue in the chat box. Um, nope, okay, Greg has, has put in a question, so I'll get to that first. Um, did you collect any data on any deprescribing events? So we're only collecting information about pharmacists as prescribing events, and so we don't have any way to capture deprescribing events really um, with our data collection. It's also really hard to even capture deprescribing events like in regular administrative data. You'd used to be looking, I guess, for like when a prescription ends and seeing that it doesn't restart. Um, but when a pre prescription doesn't restart, you're not able to see like who's responsible for that sort of alteration in care. Um, that's the sort of thing that um, would be great to know though. And hopefully we'll see, you know, administrative data being able to capture deprescribing somewhat as we sort of move forward and begin to really see the value of deprescribing um, as a part of routine care. Yeah, great. Um, thanks for that, Greg. Um, yeah, my question was just sort of at the beginning of your slide deck, um, seeing kind of the reason um, for people who need attachment to a primary care provider in Nova, Scotia, um, in Nova Scotia, was just curious how that might play out against other provinces. I was actually, I thought those numbers were very revealing and, and quite high in some cases. So curious if that's similar across other provinces and territories. I think that there's like family physician shortages probably across the country. I'm pretty uh, familiar with the Nova Scotia situation um, because there's a really great study being led by Dr. Emily Gard Marshall looking at attachment to family practices um, and in particular looking at how the need of family practice registry is working here. Um, I believe she's going to be extending her study to Ontario and maybe Quebec and Nova Scotia. There's four provinces, I think, in the end that they're going to be looking at um, improving uh, attachment to family physicians. But the general story is like in Nova Scotia, it's not great. And there's a lot of recruitment happening right now to get more family physicians in the province. It's particularly problematic because, you know, we're quite rural here. And so trying to encourage, you know, new physicians to move to rural areas and take huge practices is really, um, really challenging, I think. Great. Thank you so much, Shanna. Any other questions? Um, I'll encourage people to type those into the chat box. Um, but thank you again. Um, next, I'd like to introduce Paula Gonzalez. Um, she can get her slide deck up. Thank you. Great to see you. Um, Paula is an assistant professor of management information systems at the Faculty of Management, also at Dalhousie University. She teaches and researches in the areas of IT leadership, digital innovation, and IT healthcare there. Her work has been published in peer-reviewed journals and conference proceedings in information systems and healthcare, such as journal of as such as the Journal of Strategic Information Systems and the Journal of Healthcare Quality. Thanks, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Annalise, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm so glad that she's to go after Shana. I'm also here talking from, I'm on campus today, Dalhousie University, and as I was introduced, yes, I'm in the Faculty of Management and I'm part of the 
Safe Assured Research Group, uh, together with uh, Jim Barker, who is the director, and Kumote as well. Uh, the project of this group, it's, I mean, one of the goals of this group is to ensure the reliability of community pharmacies in Canada and abroad. And we are also extending our interest in other healthcare settings. The research that I'm presenting today um, actually aligns with uh, what was discussed by Katrina at the beginning about the regulatory and, and how we can enhance medication incidence reporting. And there's a project that I'm leading in the group and just focusing on how we can enhance that reporting using some design principles and focusing in the systems per se. So we are partnering with PharmaPod initially and Think Research. PharmaPod is, is um, one of the uh, leading platforms um, when it comes to medication incidence reporting. So as an introduction, you know, we, we see a lot of research done and, and the consequences of medication incidence um, with patients, families, pharmacies, um, and society in general. And one way you, that we found, you know, it's important to collect data and as an information system researchers, that's what we usually do. You know, we, we find ways or digital systems to collect the data, but to collect a, a store and analyze the data. So medication incident reporting was one way of creating that platform to start collecting the data. Uh, despite you know the benefits that we've seen having such a platform, we still see, based on empirical research and some um, discussion with with practitioners in the field, that there are still barriers to report medication errors. And I was glad to see even and to report in any other aspects, right? Like quality. One of the questions from Greg in the chat that you know some of the barriers that we see, uh, you can see it in the slide, but also um. um just understanding a little bit about the workflow, you no know, time constraint. Uh, pharmacies do more than reporting, in this case, medication incidents. They have way more other responsibilities. So time constraint for sure is one of the biggest barriers here. But we also are quite um, curious to see that the lack of perceived value of such a system as well. So one of the objectives with this project is uh, just to try to identify other designed uh, guidelines, principles that can help us keep mitigating those incidents, but trying to attempt and change those negative perceptions towards medication errors, motivate pharmacies to increase that reporting and increase the usability of the systems. How we look or how we usually look into understanding how a technology or a system is embedded in organizations, it comes initially from a social technical system perspective. So you have a system that is embedded in an organization or in a social subsystem. And, and that um, embeddedness will um, end up being on a resistance or facilitated or improving some of the practices that happen in the context. So when you see John optimization, the, the main outcome when we embed a system or we have a system to support certain activities is just to bring that harmony between the two um, in order to optimize productivity. And in this case, of course, to optimize patient safety. So when we were looking at, you know, understanding how they just assessing what is already existing in terms of medication incident reporting, we look at the already some of the guiding design principles um, from human computer interaction. And we know the administrative principles and utility principles, you see the list on the left and on the right, some examples of what we assess systems, they are already in place. And not just medication incident reporting, but other healthcare systems. These systems are really targeting or the design principles to, to support the task. And that's the, the first thing we support the task. We are going to uh, enhance the business practice. But something that we notice is that persuasive principles are not already there. So that was the intention. The intention was trying to use a persuasive system design model. It's a framework uh, to really understand how we can you know, design strategies that can enhance, in this case, the practice of medication incident reporting. 
So the process of this research, you know, we assess, but then we design and evaluate those strategies, designing prototype scenarios. We test that and then we um, check the effectiveness of those strategies. So we are in the first stage. So by assessing the platform from PharmaPod, we found that we were impressed actually quite uh, advanced they were and implementing implementing some of the administrative and primary task designs. Uh, currently they have you know 20% um, and this is an average um, percentage that we find. And some of the design principles, persuasive design principles were partially implemented in there. Uh, we also found as we expected for some of the healthcare systems currently in the market an opportunity for improvement. So I'm gonna give you just in the few slides left for today's presentation, just a quick overview of what do we mean by those persuasive design guidelines that, that most of you probably are familiar in terms of using certain systems of applications when you use Fitbit that is just giving you or some weight management um, applications to really um, help you do or stimulate a behavior. Uh, so these are some of the features that we are gonna keep um, discussing in the next few slides. So you have goal settings and when you said PI means partially implemented, uh, self-monitoring tunneling, for example, is the system will provide you and explain, you know, in a stepwise by a step fashion, such as software installation wizard. I'm gonna go quick on this partially implemented, but just focus on the ones that we find um, will be important uh, features to increase that um, or persuade, persuade users to medication incident reporting. So we have praise, feedback, and emotional appeal. So these are some framing that we can insert in certain parts of the reporting. And again, by medication incident reporting, we are talking not about the errors, but also about the near misses reporting, which we can learn uh, quite as a potential there that we can also learn. These are examples, you know, and it's that you achieve a 30% of your goal, um, or for example, messages that to wear is human, to share is divine. We also found that the social support guidelines could be a potential for improvement. And, and this was something that we got from some of the users that we, um, when we go back and forth assessing some of the strategies with, with pharmacists, they were concerned about the anonymity of, you know, when we trying to implement those features. But there, the, everything can be actually keep anonymous as long as we can probably I'm, I'm sharing or I'm, I'm sharing a comment or I'm, I'm filling up a report and messages like other, you know, five other people are currently submitted the incident report or 10 others submitted the incident report today. These are messages that have been based on research has um, created a motivation to, to change a behavior that we are aiming to change. Authority, verifiability, real world feel. And again, we can go in details of that. And then we have a conceptual paper that is already under review that we can see more of the explanation of these strategies. And as a conclusion, we find that there is a potential, you know, that we that the primary task support credibility for error reporting is there. And again, as a development of system, that's that's usually the first step. Uh, we found that it's a lack of built in social motivational features and some social data support. And the introduction of these features could actually enhance the perceived usefulness of those reports and ended up you know, increasing the report and, or, and uh, patient safety. Uh, future work evaluating the effectiveness of these strategies, creating the prototypes and measuring the effectiveness. Um, so there are some references that we have again in the slide uh, deck, but also happy to share. Wonderful, thank you so much. Um, and thank you for that introduction to, introduction and kind of overview of how this persuasive design principles is, has really integrated into your research and into your team. I think it's um, newer for me. And so I think that that's a nice way of kind of combining um, some of what's going on in our communities um, with, with research that we can publish. Um, let people type in any questions that they might have into the chat box. Um, Paula, wondering if there's any good, really good data that gives us confidence in knowing 
how significant a problem underreporting actually might be. And if there are certain kinds of incidents that are more likely to go underreported or unreported at all. This is another project we're actually working on understanding the data that, that we're trying to see, you know, what are those incidents that are underreporting. Uh, right now, we are looking into Some, some of the data that we find, you know, you, you, it's not that it's underreported or not. Users will report, um, you know, prescription uh, errors or dispensing error or medication incident deliveries. That's actually what we found doing a post, um, post and during pandemic that the medication incident deliveries increased. So we go back and trying to understand them. I'm just gonna get it. I, I don't have exact data which one are underreported because that's more quality. But what we have noticed is that because you come and trying to fill a report and then you do it very quickly or you're good, you do it after the fact, then you forget uh, details. So even though the system will have the taxonomy that you can choose so that we can categorize contributing factors or type of medicines you know that was involved so the level of detail that's the problem we are looking at so the, 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 the system is giving you the information but the user just types other and sometimes just lack of entering that thorough information that will be useful when we want to learn from the reporting and 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 on top of that quality improvement you know the platform that we are analyzing has an amazing platform in quality improvement um, capabilities, but is underused. So this is one of the main concerns that we have at the moment. So how we can, we also are aware that the, this is, as I said at the beginning, is not really part of the practice for pharmacies. So they are burnt out. And I also, you know, part of my other research, I look at techno stress and that's something, another research that I'm looking into the multiple systems that they are using. So to report, uh, an incident is just at the bottom of the list. So that was a long answer for your question, <laughs> but, but it's just the level of detail and, and, and also the lack of accurate, how you could accurate you're gonna enter what actually happened with the report. Yeah, no, thank you for that. I think, um, I think there's a lot of components to it and, and obviously the, um, time component of, of work in pharmacy across, I think, all pharmacy sectors of people having enough time to do things in real time is, is a huge overarching issue. So um, all the best with those cross-cutting research projects that are underway. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Great. So yeah, any other questions, um, feel, please feel free to continue the conversation in the chat box. Um, I'm now going to introduce our two final research presenters of the day. Um, I'll also just be getting their slide deck up in a minute, um, but I'll introduce them first. So Sertina Ho and Ju Young Lee are our final research presentations for today. Sertina is a graduate of the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy here at the University of Toronto. She obtained her graduate degrees in library and information science and in education from the, from the University of Toronto. She completed her PhD dissertation at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education and holds a faculty appointment at the Department of Psychiatry and the Faculty of Pharmacy at the University of Toronto, the School of Pharmacy at the University of Waterloo, and the Michael G. DeGroote School of Medicine at McMaster University, with a focus on educational program evaluation and scholarship, development of patient and medication safety, and quality improvement curriculum, respectively. Ju Young is a is currently a fourth year pharmacy student at the Leslie Dan Faculty of Pharmacy in the PharmD program. With Dr. Sertina Ho and her colleagues, Ju Young endeavors to find ways to identify ways to facilitate adverse drug reaction reporting to prevent errors and advance patient safety. So welcome to you both and I will just put up your deck here. Thank you, Annalise. Hi everyone, I am Sertina, and it's my pleasure to be here together with Ju Yang and share with you a project that was completed by Adrian Boucher as a partial fulfillment of the requirements of his industrial pharmacy residency program in 2019. I'm the faculty advisor of this project and Adrian has given us the permission to share his work with you today. Next slide, please. 
Juyang and I have no conflicts of interest to disclose for this presentation. Next slide, please. Um, although health and drug products are carefully tested for safety, efficacy, and quality before they are licensed, adverse drug reactions or ADRs may not become evident until the product is marketed and used by the general public. An ADR is defined as any noxious and unintended response to a drug, which occurs in doses normally used or tested for the diagnosis, treatment, or prevention of a disease or the modification of an organic function. What I'm trying to say here is ADRs typically are unpreventable, which is different from a medication incident, typically. In Canada, it is estimated that 24% of hospital admissions and 12% of emergency department visits were due to drug-related adverse events, of which approximately one-third are the result of ADRs. Next slide, please. In Canada, ADR reports are usually submitted by health professionals and consumers or patients on a voluntary basis, either directly to Health Canada or via market authorization holders or MAH. The MAH is typically the pharmaceutical company. If a safety signal is identified through these reports, appropriate action is taken, which may include resulting in distribution of new product safety information, recommending changes to a product's labeling, or even requesting removal of a product from the market. Next slide, please. However, this process can be slow and may result in harmful medications staying in the market for years before withdrawal. Next slide, please. Pharmacists play an important role in, ident in identifying, reporting, and preventing ADRs. Overall, pharmacists account for 8% of ADR reports to the Canada Vigilance Program and up to 25% of reports to the MAH or the pharmaceutical companies. It is estimated that pharmacists report under 10% of ADRs to voluntary reporting systems. Therefore, understanding the factors that affect Canadian pharmacists' engagement in ADR reporting activities would help to develop strategies to improve reporting in Canada. Next slide, please. This project is aimed to provide insight into the knowledge, attitudes, and behaviors of Ontario pharmacists towards medication safety and ADR reporting. Next slide, please. Participants of our project were Part A pharmacists, that is pharmacists who can provide patient care registered with the Ontario College of Pharmacists, who indicate consent to be contacted for research during their annual renewal. Eligible participants were recruited via email, at which time they were provided with an information letter and consent form and a link to the online questionnaire. A six minute 29 item online questionnaire was developed based on a prior literature review. Content validity and phase validity were assessed using a pilot with nine practicing Ontario pharmacists and the questionnaire was administered for a two week period in October, 2019, during which the participants were receiving two reminder emails. Quantitative data was analyzed using descriptive statistics and thematic analysis written responses to three questions that focus on the barriers, facilitators and supports or opportunities to improve ADR reporting were conducted. Ethics approval of this project was obtained through the University of Toronto Research Ethics Board. Next slide, please. We received seven and 703 responses, a response rate of 11.2%. Most participants were full-time staff pharmacists in the community setting, where 700 to 1,500 prescriptions were dispensed per week. Over 40% had more than 20 years of a practice experience. And the results reflected pharmacists' perception towards medication safety and ADR reporting. And I'm going to go over uh, what we found pertaining to medication safety. And Ju Yang will share our findings regarding ADR reporting. Next slide, please. Pharmacists were overall quite happy with the current system and environment with respect to medication safety. Almost 70% of participants agreed that prescription medications were generally safe and they were confident in how the federal government and drug companies researched, regulated, and monitored drug safety. Next slide, please. Over 50% of participants agreed that they believed members of their profession stayed informed about the safety of drugs. However, contrary to the satisfaction and confidence that was described in the previous slide, pharmacists were not very confident that other health professionals were equally informed. Next slide, please. Pharmacists generally stayed informed about new drug safety information and knew where to look for this information. They used a variety of resources, including online medical databases, government publications, and information from drug companies. Overall, pharmacists were satisfied with the resources currently available for accessing new drug safety information. And I'm going to turn over to Ju Yang, who will then cover our findings regarding ADR reporting. 
Thank you, Sertina. So to just to cover the last few parts of the presentation, I'll be discussing the findings pertaining to the ADR reporting. In our survey, over 50% agreed or strongly agreed that ADRs are a serious problem in Canada. And in overwhelming majority, so almost 95% agreed or strongly agreed that ADR reporting is part of the professional role of a pharmacist, but the majority also believe that less than 10% of ADRs were actually being reported by, by pharmacists. Over 80% said they knew how to report an ADR, but also 63% had not reported an ADR in the past 12 months. So this suggests that the low reporting rates are not necessarily due to a lack of knowledge of the reporting process as found in similar surveys of pharmacists in other countries. Um, however, the issue seems to really lie from other health system barriers, which were explored in our follow-up questions. Next slide, please. So with respect to who pharmacists were reporting to, the most common receivers were drug manufacturers, Health Canada, or the organization pharmacists work for, for example, the community pharmacies corporate or head office, or even a combination of these outlets. And on average, it took around five to 30 minutes to complete a report. So next slide. So to really gain a better understanding on ADR reporting and the different factors that either negatively or positively affect ADR reporting amongst pharmacists, we asked a few questions. And the first one here is, what may discourage you from reporting an ADR? The most common responses to this question were, I don't have time to report, the reaction is already well known, and I'm uncertain of the association between the reaction and the drug. We also gave participants the option to write in their own words their answers uh, under the other section. And I took a few representative responses and put them at the bottom of the slide here. So at the end of it all, we took the both, both the quantitative and qualitative responses to analyze them. And we came up with some themes which will be shared with you near the end of the presentation. So in terms of barriers to reporting, common responses also included the lack of interprofessional collaboration and not knowing if other healthcare providers were reporting correctly or even at all. Next slide. We then asked what may encourage you to report. So facilitators for ADR reporting. And the most common responses to this question were, the drug is new to the market, the reaction is life-threatening, or the reaction has not been reported in the product monograph. As well, some of the other more unique responses uh, supported these common responses, but also spoke about compensation, ease of reporting within their daily workflow and in that integration into their uh, existing software systems. And finally, the last next slide, please. We asked participants what may help pharmacists be more engaged in ADR reporting. And the most common responses here were increasing pharmacists awareness of ADR reporting and its value in patient safety, educating pharmacists on how to report ADRs and providing less time consuming methods for ADR reporting. For example, simplified reporting forms. In addition to, again, interprofessional efforts, reimbursement for their time, and the integration of reporting into their workflow seem to be main uh, comments that arise with this question. I think it's important to note here that ADR reporting at this point is already mandatory in hospitals as per Vanessa's law uh, starting in December 16, 2019. This survey was actually conducted in October of 2019. And the sur survey suggests that pharmacists don't think that this will make a huge difference in, in pharmacist engagement. As you can see, about 25.3% of participants uh, selected the option of making ADR reporting mandatory. And to speak on the educational side of things, previous studies have found limited success with educational interventions. For example, a team led by Figueres uh, conducted a, ran a randomized control trial to measure the effect of educational outreach visits to physicians, and they found significant improvement in the quantity and quality of ADRs, but they found that these effects returned to baseline up after about a year. So it's likely that a combined intervention consisting of education, yes, but also greater integration of reporting into pr practitioner's workflow and providing feedback on their uh, reporting would provide a more robust and lasting effect. Next slide, please. So to tie it all in here, we took the quantitative and qualitative responses and identified common themes that shed light on the barriers facilitators and supports needed for ADR reporting. So as you can see, some of the common themes that came up for the barriers or what may discourage reporting ADRs consist of lack of uh, interprofessional collaboration, duplication of reporting, the fact that it was time consuming and there was con concern about patient confidentiality. In terms of what may encourage uh, our pharmacists to report an ADR, were things like the integration of reporting to systems, financial compensation, the seriousness of the reaction, and identifying a strong re association between the drug and the reaction. And finally, what may help pharmacists be more engaged or in reporting or supports, 
again, interprofessional collaboration, uh, receiving report or feedback rather on the reporting, the integration of technology, as well as financial compensation seems to uh, be main themes that came up. And next slide. So we spoke about a few different things today, but just to kind of sum it all up, Ontario pharmacists play a key role in ADR reporting, and they are knowledgeable and engaged in medication safety, but they face significant barriers in reporting the ADRs. So to move forward, an integrative approach that encourages interprofessional collaboration, the ease of reporting via the integration of technology into systems, and sufficient human resources, whether that be financially or just having enough uh, staffing and time is necessary. And going further, further research should focus on the effect of implementing both the educational and the technological interventions on reporting rate and quality. So that kind of sums up our presentation and we'd be happy to take on any questions. Great, thank you both so much. I think that there are some questions in the chat, um, but maybe just quickly from my end, um, curious, I know Vanessa's law and, and mandating that these uh, ADRs have to be reported in hospital settings. Just curious, responsibility and accountability for reporting seems to be a major issue among pharmacists, but perhaps other healthcare providers. In a hospital setting, who is actually responsible for reporting the ADR? Is it the pharmacist or is it other members of the healthcare team as well? So basically, in terms of the mandatory reporting under Vanessa's law in hospitals, so every healthcare professional has that sort of responsibility to expect to be involved and engage in the reporting. So I will say, uh, even though our study look at uh, the perception from pharmacists, but within a healthcare setting, like basically all healthcare providers have that kind of responsibility to do so. Yeah, that's helpful. Thank you, yeah. Sertina. Um, lots of questions in the chat box. Um, from Kay, did you explore the idea about collaborating with a pharmacy technician colleague to support reporting? Within this study, we did not, but I think like from what the themes that you and presented, you can see the interprofessional and I think the intraprofessional collaboration between pharmacists and pharmacy technicians are really like valuable and worthwhile to explore further because that collaboration definitely will, will be um, facilitating the more reporting of the ADRs. Fantastic. Um, from Paula, glad to see an alignment between these barriers to reporting and the opportunity to introduce pers persuasive features in the systems social and dialogue support features are needed. Yeah, definitely. Um, I see I think, the alignment perfectly for ADR incident reporting. Yeah, and her colleagues are, are agreeing. Um, from Suzanne Singh, are you aware of whether pharmacists or pharmacy employers have advocated with their pharmacy vendors to integrate an electronic ADR form into their electronic system, for example, Kroll or otherwise? This seems like such a basic thing to do. Uh, Personally, I'm not aware of, but I think the potential is there because um, there are a lot of like, um, um, I would say interest from pharmacists to have everything sort of seamless approach so that it's all integrated into the dispensing system, whether it's Crow or other vendors. Uh, so definitely for ADR reporting or incident reporting, I think those can be like considered and integrated into uh, the dispensing system, which basically we have to use it for any single particular prescription processing. So I think that perfect, perfectly makes sense to have that kind of like potential there. Great. And then I'll just get through um, a, a few more quick questions um, from Derek. To what extent do you believe your respondents are representative of typical practicing pharmacists? The low response rate is the context for this question. And did you do any analyses to determine this? Uh, first of all, I think I've done different, uh, I would say, survey in different provinces. If I can get anything more than 8% in the pharmacy profession, I think that was going to be really exciting. I have to say, I know Derek, you're from Saskatchewan. Like I, I am very impressed with Saskatchewan response to survey responses. If I actually ask the college or the PRA to help, uh, and that is the only province I have to say that I have seen that the, the, the response rate is actually better than I thought, which will go closer to 20%. Um, so this one, I think the other reason for this is um, the duration. We only uh, have it for two weeks. So I'm not sure if we sort of expand it to like a four week, we may get maybe a bit more of response rate. But in terms of the uh, representation, like if you look at a uh, majority of them are community pharmacists, um, most of them have over 20 years of practice experience. I think that to some extent there is some representative there. Um, although like we, we did ask for direct patient care, part A pharmacist in Ontario, um, then I don't think we, we hear too many responses back from hospital, uh, looking at the table one or the demographics of this, uh, of this survey. 
Great, thank you. And then just last question from Anne, was there discussion or suggestion about who would or could pay for ADR reporting? Uh, I don't think there is that kind of information from the free text um, uh, response, but what I interpret the uh, compensation is, is that a really sort of like directly paying for that? I think another way to look at that will be protected time for doing reporting, whether it is ADR or incident within their sort of scheduled shift. So even like the last 50 minutes of a shift, like a time for reflecting on that day's work uh, that was protected for those kind of activities. Uh, that may be an, another way to look at compensation instead of like uh, uh, pay for like incident per incident, for example, or per ADR reporting. That may be sort of the way to look at the compensation financially. Right. Okay. A few more comments from Katrina and Greg in the chat. I'll let um, Sertina and Ju Young feel free to look at those. Um, but thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. Um, so next, everyone, um, for those of who might have joined us two weeks ago um, and those who might be joining us for the first time, um, we're going to be breaking out into some small group sharing circles. So I have um, split people, I'll split people in a moment into various breakout rooms. Um, your group should have a facilitator who will introduce themselves. Um, but really our goal for the session is to just take 10 or 15 minutes to kind of reflect on our conversations today, the presentations. Um, so there's opportunities to discuss as a group several questions. I'll put these in the chat um, on this slide and then also want to share some of the questions, the great questions that Katrina posed in her keynote. So I will throw these into the chat um, quickly, but in the meantime, I will just break people out into breakout rooms. We'll come back as a group at about 2.58. So we'll give people hopefully some good time to have a chat and then Zubin and I will wrap up for today. Right, so I can see we have people trickling back in slowly from the breakout room. So just give people another 20 seconds or so to come in from those, but hope that the discussion went well in, in some of those small group sessions. Wonderful. Okay, I think we have almost everyone back in from the small group chat. So um, hope that those went well. I think overall a huge, huge number of perspectives from across Canada. Zubin and I were just kind of briefly chatting about that of uh, what a privilege it is just to hear from a lot of people doing a lot of great things across the country um, and, and our ability to hear about that. So um, just to wrap us up for today, I just wanted to provide a little bit more information on how to get in contact with us if you have any other questions, comments, etc. cetera. Um, so more information on OPEN, the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network. Um, the contact email Twitter account is there as well as the link for subscribing to the newsletter. Um, so in addition to OPEN, you can also contact me um, at the Center for Practice Excellence, which I manage with Zubin. You can also join our mailing list and hear more about events like this, as well as our monthly speaker series, like Zubin mentioned at the beginning of our event today. Um, and feel free to get in touch if you um, are curious to hear about anything else. So I will pass it over to Zubin to just close this out for today, but thank you so much, everyone. This has been fun. First and foremost, thank you very much, Annalise, for all of your work in organizing today's session. All of us know what a job it is to organize these kinds of sessions, and Annalise does it with such an effortless aplomb. It is sincerely appreciated, as is your attendance today and your active contributions. Please join us at our next open symposium in a couple of weeks, and we look forward to seeing you at other activities run through the Center for Practice Excellence or the Ontario Pharmacy Evidence Network. Thank you for joining us today, and see you soon.